All right, hello. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and as you can see, the title of this talk is Have Fun the Wrong Way, which I hope we can all appreciate the intellectual depth that, required, that was required to come up with that pun and that name. Um, so before I, I dive in proper, it doesn't show up particularly well in this image, unfortunately. But what this actually is, is a, um, um, a very nice photo, um, I believe titled Perspective on uh, Edinburgh Castle. Um, and it's through a park bench, which a person or two in this room would understand the significance of this to me. Um, a couple nights ago, I've been, I've been in uh, since um, Monday, but a couple of nights ago I was out having some drinks with some folks here, some, some wonderful people, um, a few too many drinks, and my uh, generally terrible sense of direction uh, kicked in. As it turned out, as I was trying to walk back to the flat I've been staying, uh, I became completely disoriented and completely lost. But fortunately, I did find a park, um, and in the wee hours of the morning, spent maybe a couple of hours sleeping on a friendly park bench. So this is a wonderfully accepting and, and, and lo lovely city. Um, and I've had a, a certain perspective on it since I've been here. Uh, but what are we actually here to talk about? So, so what is wrong, right? Wrong, wrong was supposed to be Ruby and, and Pong. That's the idea, right? Ruby plus Pong. Um, you know, so an implementation of, of Pong in Ruby. Um, why? Why would one do this? Well, one, I, I, I just I love old school games. Um, and I've always wanted to, to you know, write a game and construct and create a game. Um, back in university, I dabbled a little bit with some 3D graphics stuff, but it's not really my cup of tea, um, kind of like the classic style, um, and had always just wanted to kind of do that. Uh, but in addition, sort of the mission statement, the goal was uh, to basically, if this is the productivity button, to basically uh, uh, blow the productivity button off of uh, my fellow Rubyists and fellow Ruby shops and consultancies and have these people playing Pong, right? So it was a networked game, of, a version of, of Pong, and it was going to be so fun. Um, you know, with leaderboards and whatnot, that uh, we would all want to play it, and and you know, I, you know, the company I worked for worked for a company called Edgecase back in the uh, USA, and we would simply ban it, and we would, we would get a uh, significant productivity increase just by dragging everyone else down. It'd be great. No, not really. But um, but really, I was just looking, you know, to, to do a, a fun implementation of a game to make it cross-platform and to include some robust network code because I find that interesting. So um, if, if that goal was, was robustness, <clears throat> is wrong um, robust, right? Uh, that's, that's not Marvin Shakespeare, that's robot plus bust. Uh, it, it is, is wrong robust? Uh, and the answer is no. No, it's not. Um, I sort of, you know, I, I, I failed to date to meet that goal. Um, right now, wrong is, is a nice um, client implementation, but it's not necessarily as it currently stands client server. I didn't hit that goal for, for this. But we are going to talk, ideally, um, you know, how that would be done and how it will be done, uh, given a little bit more time. But So let's talk about uh, first about drawing the game and, and how to actually draw uh, something on the screen. Um, some people, some of us may be familiar with Gosu. Um, Gosu is an awesome... <coughs> uh, that, that, that would say, if, that, if um, my slide were aligned properly, that would say 2D drawing and, and game library. So Gosu is a, uh, it's implemented in C, uh, C++. There's a, uh, a version, a library bindings for C++ and for Ruby. So it's a, it's a uh, library for drawing simple 2D, uh, 2D graphics and doing 2D gaming. So it has fundamental constructs of, of uh, games and game loops. So uh, 2D graphics can test, uh, uh, text, excuse me, uh, accelerated by 3D hardware, uh, has support for doing uh, sound samples and playing uh, songs and, and, and basic uh, uh, sound effects, and has uh, input uh, control primitives so, so that you can read input coming in from uh, various sources. Um, this is uh, the example event loop that Ghost uses, and in general, uh, 
uh, you know, in, in varying levels of complexity, uh, the core game loop that any game engine um, would use. And this particular graphic is, is ripped um, shamelessly from uh, the Gosu wiki page. But in, in essence, um, you construct uh, an initial window, so you construct some sort of screen buffer, or something, you know, a palette upon which you draw on the screen. Um, you read for some input events to see what external changes are coming from the outside that may be looking for key presses or for mouse movement, uh, gamepad movement. Um, run uh, an update, so based off of the previous state of the game and given any new inputs that have come in, we're going to do some logic, maybe move characters around, move, you know, pushing pixels basically. Um, and then draw that and then just loop and repeat ad infinitum until someone quits out of the game. Um, so an element that comes into effect here uh, is say, discrete versus delta time. So if, a, if uh, the game loops, it's going to loop at some effectively a frame rate, right? So maybe it's going to loop every 60 uh, frames per second, ideally. Depending on the amount of work that you're going to be doing, that could go up and down if you're doing a lot of complex calculations. In this case, we're talking about Pong, um, and although it was you know, a massive um, hit and a massive landmark and a wonderful achievement uh, for all of us, particularly you know, us gamers these days, as well as people interested in, in computer engineering in general, in general, when it hit in 77, uh, it was a big deal. Now it's not so taxing, right? Um, but there are other games that are. So this issue starts to come into effect. So discrete versus uh, delta. Uh, time-based. Discrete would be um, if we take as an assumption that uh, there are going to be 60 uh, loops of my, uh, 60 iterations of my game loop during a second or during you know, a, a given time frame, um, then I'll simply update the simulated physics based off of that breakdown, right? So if I know that um, I want my uh, character to be able to move uh, 30 pixels over the space of a second, then um, we know given that, or to simplify the math for myself, let's say they should be able to move 60 pixels over the space of a second. Um, given uh, 1 60th of a second loop iteration, then they're going to move um, one pixel uh, per, per update, correct? Versus delta time. And delta time would be between the loops um, between the actual discrete loops, I'm going to check the elapsed time in milliseconds. And then I'm going to apply traditional, you know, classical you know, kinematics and physics to you know, uh, time-based um, uh, physics equations, right? Um, and actually run those calculations in real time. Which um, is, for a game like Pong, if you're just implementing it simply on a client, um, you could go either way and the delta is going to be simpler. Or, excuse me, I'm sorry, discrete is going to be simpler. But delta time might become relevant if you're going to be synchronizing with a server across a network um, because the clock rates or the, you know, the, the, the rates um, at which the loop's running or various other uh, latency issues might skew if you're assuming um, a discrete time that's the same on both sides. OK, so let's talk about uh, points, shapes, and hitboxes. So, um, Points is just kind of a reference to, you know, in, in most simple 2D games like this, and in, in, in particular uh, in Pong, um, we're just talking simple uh, point-based physics. We're not talking about, um, you know, taking into account uh, mass or density or uh, anything other than just basic uh, particle physics. So even in a game... Uh, on the left, it's a little bit harder to see, but that's uh, that was a Counter-Strike model, which is a popular uh, first-person shooter who's, who's played Counter-Strike at some point in their lives. Yeah. Good game. Um, and then, of course, on the, on the right, we see another classic game we should all recognize, which is coming from, uh, which is the original Super Mario Brothers game um, from Nintendo. Um, the physics of Mario are based around a single point in space, right? Even though, even though Mario, of course, when you look at that model, um, it's, it, it looks like it has height and width. Effectively, any physics calculations being done on that are being operated upon a single point. Um, but Mario has a, has a distinct shape, as does this uh, more complex model, uh, the Counter-Strike model. Um, the shape that Mario is in, um, right, it, it does occupy um, 2D space. Um, 
but it's distinct and different from the concept of a hitbox. So in some cases, you're going to keep track of uh, the points in 2D space that define a particular shape, maybe be it a star, uh, a rectangle, what have you, that correspond to um, the, you know, what the element or what the object will look like drawn on the screen. But then separately from that, you can keep track of a hitbox. And a hitbox is used to calculate um, intersections. So this, you know, there's no, no need to, to read through that terrible glob of, of text uh, closely, but it's essentially a very simple check for um, doing intersection of two objects um, in, in 2D space given um, rectangular hitboxes, right? So if I want to do collision detection, say in the case of Pong, if I want to know that the paddle and the ball are going to run into each other, which is relevant information given that we want the, the paddle to hit the ball, right? Um, simply can check to see are any of the points inside this uh, 2D rectangular shape that represents either the pallet or the ball, um, will uh, a point in one be contained within the bounds of another? And that's, this is just a very sort of brain dead simple check for that. Um, but there are some things to think about. Um, in this case, this is kind of illustrating that a simple 2D rectangular shape for a hitbox, um, also known um, uh, as a, a uh, collision mapping, um, might not actually lead to good results. Like you might, uh, in your particular game, if the shape, you know, given the shape of, of your object and the hitbox of the object are going to be different, and there's, if there's significant, significant incongruity, um, then the player might see the, you know, visual discrepancy. Oh, he didn't, he didn't actually hit me, right? So this is kind of this drawing um, uh, taken from a very nice uh, discussion on hitboxes in general. Um, is kind of illustrating that, right? You know, you've got a touche, and yet there's actually no contact. Um, so for more complex, um, so a nice library to handle um, Let's jump back real quick. Um, so this could be a concern. However, in Pong, in a, very, in a very simple, bare bones version of it, all of your shapes are rectangles and squares, right? So actually, the, there is congruence between uh, the bounding box and the, the shape. So you don't have this particular issue. Um, so to that end, and the, the extent would, you know, when, when I implemented Pong as a client game, as something you could play, um, just hand rolled bounding boxes and shapes and, and, and intersection logic because it's so simple. But for more complex games, um, you might look at uh, a library called Chipmunk, which, again, if you've heard of Gosu, you've probably heard of Chipmunk uh, in conjunction with it, um, which if you can't tell that's the slightly that, that image, that's a Star Wars scout trooper riding on the back of a, of a chipmunk, which I think is pretty spectacular. Um, but as is the, uh, the chipmunk uh, library itself. So it provides uh, more advanced features, things that, um, that are uh, you know, fairly sophisticated algorithms for, for collision detection, in particular of large amounts of objects. Um, so it is 2D collision based, um, but it provides primitives. Instead of a simple rectangular bounding box, it has uh, circles, complex polygons. Um, you can assign multiple bounding boxes to the same object, right? So you um, can have different and, and uh, overlaid uh, collision areas. Um, and it's implemented in C. It's very fast. It's much faster than a native Ruby implementation would be. It uses, a, say, a spatial hashing algorithm. So if I want to run collision detection against, in Pong, it's pretty simple. I've got a ball. I've got two paddles. They may hit. They may not on any particular iteration of the game loop. If I'm doing something more complex, let's say uh, a game like this, right? This, is, uh, this would be uh, Galaxy, wait, Geometry Wars, thank you, um, which is awesome. But, um, but there's a lot, if you've ever played Gal uh, Geometry Wars, I don't know why I'm saying Galaxy Wars, um, there's a lot going on at any, any given time on the screen. There's just a much, much larger number of potential entities. And to check for collisions, Technically, a, a naive approach is you simply, you have to actually check each individual element against others and say, you know, uh, um, do these two um, 
items intersect. And obviously, that, the number of comparisons you need to do blows up very quickly um, as the number of elements increases. So uh, Chipmunk uses a, uh, a basically a spatial hashing algorithm, which is a first high-level pass that can, can kind of rule out. You know, if I know that this object is down at the lower left, and, and I, I know I don't need to do any comparisons against things that are, that are at the upper right quadrant of, of, of the screen, right? Because they're not going to collide. Um, so Chipmunk provides for things like that. Um, a sort of a point related um, uh, on this particular topic. So um, when writing, a, in particular writing a 2D game, or in games in general, um, you know, you're writing a game, not a simulation. Like, yes, uh, complex physics is simulated, um, and you are simulating interactions at certain levels, but any time you can do you know, optimizations, anytime you can take a less complex route, um, you know, do so. It doesn't actually need to correspond to the physical reality of, of what would underlie, you know, a real, um, a real system. So this is just a very simple example of that. Unfortunately, um, I ran, you know, the cardinal sin, I've run my uh, text up against the left here. But, but the gist of it is saying, um, it could have taken, and again, in a Pong implementation, it's not a big deal, really. But, uh, it could have taken the route of, say, drawing bounding boxes around the top and bottom of the screen, for example, or something along those lines. And on every iteration, could just check and see, you know, because naively or just immediately you could think, what, what's the question I'm trying to answer? Oh, did the paddle run into the top of, 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 the, of the screen or the board area, right? I don't want to let run off. Um, and so because you're thinking in terms of doing this collision detection, you might try to do that. Well, but you don't need to do that, right? This is, again, this is a naive example, but... All you have to do is check, is, has the paddle exceeded what I know to be the upper bound to be, um, then I can move it back down, right? As opposed to actually doing some sort of collision and having it bounce off of or something like that. There's no need in this case to do that. Very simple example, but um, generally valid principle. So if we're actually talking about client-server, um, you know, some related issues to implementing uh, a game over a network, right? So if I, you know, the, the goal, um, the goal of uh, wrong, you know, someday here soon, is to allow you know me to play a game of pong with you, and we'll you know feeling slightly fuzzy and happy about it because it's implemented in Ruby, um, but we can be in, in different locations or we can be across the team room or, or what have you, right? Um, so some different ways, some issues that are going to come up um, in that. So th this, um, oh, thankfully this one's not too far off this. this too far off the screen here. Um, this is a very simple um, you know, start at if I wanted to write uh, on the server side, right? So if, if I wanted to write uh, the server half of my client server implementation, um, uh, some very fundamental socket programming stuff going on here. Uh, if I open up, in this case, and, and who actually, let me ask real quick. Who in the room has done socket programming in Ruby? And of those that have, who's done socket programming in C or C++ or in Java, right? So there's a uh, very high correspondence between the API in Ruby of uh, doing uh, you know, fundamental socket programming as there is to the underlying you know, C implementation, right? The underlying system calls, um, which is a good thing, right? I mean, sockets are not. Um, they're about as abstract as you can want them to be, um, given you know the sort of the performance characteristics and the, and the low-level details that you're dealing with, right? So here we just see that um, we're opening up a new socket, and in this case we're binding to the uh, socket uh, loopback address, and and just doing a listen. So we're at that point, open up. We've basically opened up a port. We've chosen in this case it's port uh, 7664, and we're listening for incoming connections. Now, in this case, um, I've, I've set the uh, acceptable number of concurrent connections fairly low because this would be the naive case of I have a server, but I'm really only looking to play, you know, serve one game simultaneously you know, at a time. Um, the more interesting and eventual approach would be if you want to choose to host. Um, you know, two dozen games of, of Pong at the same time because there's just such this desperate uh, you know, need in your office to be playing Pong, um, you could do so. 
But right here, we're simply waiting to see that we've got uh, two accepted connections. At that point, um, we're going to kind of move on into, into a game loop, right? And at that point, you've got two clients connected to you, and you can start up a game and start passing game data back and forth. Um, similarly, on the client side, and of course, unfortunately, this one's a little bit worse, um, but you're going you're to connect on the same port to the server, so this is going to be the client reaching out, and start uh, receiving um, packets from the server. And in this case, if you could see a little closer, saying so we'll be just pushing these messages, these received messages, into some sort of buffer. Right? Um, and that buffer in this case would probably be something like a, a ring buffer. So a ring buffer is just uh, an interesting and useful data structure. Uh, it's fairly simple, but um, it winds up being very useful in, in network programming and in uh, client server programming in general and also client server games. So in this case, uh, the ring buffer as a data structure works effectively like this. It's basically, it looks, it's just like a linked list, um, but of, of finite size um, or a, um, uh, basically a queue of finite size, right? So if I can push cat on, I can push dog on, I can push boy on. If I go to push on fox, then we'll see that cat has been sort of bumped off the end, right? And why, was this, why would this be relevant? Of course, yes, that's hard to see, unfortunately. But um, what, what, what kind of, how is this useful? What's the underlying principle here? Um, as messages are, being come in, as, are coming from, from a server, for example, let's say you're getting continued updates of um, position data. So let me pause and ask a question. So between a, a client and server implementation, of a game, which side of that does the game run on? It's a slightly trick question, but w w which of those two actually runs the game? Server. server, right? Yeah, and and for amongst other, you know multiple reasons, why might that be? One of those, of course, the same principle that applies to web development, right? You can never trust user input. Sure, uh, you can never trust client input from your game because any enterprising uh, gamer that wants to perform well might can just go, you know, might be sending malicious data, right? If, if um, and in particular when it comes to Ruby, that's a much easier task to be doing than it is, say, in uh, a compiled C-based game, right? Um, a large number of us had raised the hand on, yes, we played Counter-Strike before, so we probably remember, you know, aim bots and wall hacks and all that, the good stuff back in the day that, I never used, but everyone that played against me must have been using. Um, so anyway, so, so, um, so that sort of provides the context. So if the uh, server is continually pushing information up to, the, up to the client, in the case of Pong, they're pushing, all right, well, paddle, the paddles are here and the ball is here and they're moving at these speeds, right? Um, and the client is, is spinning there and, and processing this input. Um, well, if something occurs such that uh, you know, the server is sending more information than the client is processing quickly enough. Um, it's going to start to get backed up. Well, you don't necessarily care. I mean, information expires and becomes stale very quickly, right? You want the most recent position-based information. You want it to reflect, you want the client representation to reflect as closely as possible the server representation. So a, a ring buffer is useful, is a useful data structure for something like that because automatically, you basically get automatic expiry. It's like cache expiration, right? Um, related to these things, so TCP versus uh, UDP, right? If you're going to be talking over the network, um, you're obviously going to be using a networking protocol of some kind. Um, and one may or may, or may not be uh, more well suited than the other. So TCP, just high level, you know, review for I'm sure most all of us are familiar, but, um, you know, TCP is connection oriented. Um, there are guarantees, right? Um, you know, message reliability and and ordering in particular, right? So, um, networks are unreliable by nature, right? And and nodes go down, timeouts occur. We all, you know, have experienced this in various ways. Um, but TCP as a protocol works uh, to preserve, you know, packet ordering. And not only that, but it actually breaks down your message um, into discrete packets for you. The API for a TCP socket is is a stream, and it. it, it 
looks and operates in, in, at a high level in, in ways that just look very similar to writing to a file, right? It's a streaming API. So whatever messages you're passing into it, it will automatically handle breaking those um, messages up into dis uh, uh, distinct and discrete packets, uh, ordering them, sending them off, and, and verifying that they all arrive and they arrive in the correct order. Um, UDP, um, by contrast, does not do that. It's basically a, 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 a fire hose that you just, you know, you shove information into and it gets sprayed out across the wire, um, but there's no, you know, there's none of this uh, control and reliability built into it. So, in fact, there's no concept of, of even a connection, right? Um, you're simply sending um, a datagram um, to a, an IP and, and, and port, right? Um, and the listening socket on the other end uh, doesn't acknowledge, you know, you as a particular sender, it just sees data coming in. Um, you have to actually manually break data into packets up yourself, so, you know, um, I might choose to make that 256 bytes, so I'm going to break my, you know, what would be a data stream into chunks of 256 bytes and shove them each across the wire. And I'm going to be guaranteed on the other side of that that I'll pull down a 256 byte chunk, but I don't won't know if I missed one, if they arrived, or if they're arriving out of order, if one was dropped, I don't know who it came from. So essentially, uh, for your application, you wind up having to recreate as much of the TCP um, features um, as your application needs. And this can be really useful um, for something like a um, for something like a first-person shooter where all I want is, is absolutely the most up-to-date information about every, where all the positions, who's firing, who's doing what, um, as quickly as possible because it's this very fast-paced, you know, this Twitch gaming, right? And if I lose a few packets along the way, uh, that's, that's okay, as long as I'm kept up, you know, as, as up to speed as, as, as quickly as possible. But still, that's going to imply that if you're writing, you know, you're, you're networking um, in terms of... Um, in terms of UDP for your game, you're going to have to do things like simulating a connection, right? Because you need to keep track of which client is which and things like that. Um, so that, um, kind of come back to that in a few moments, but that brings us to this, this concept of latency versus rewind. Um, if anyone played the original version of, well, so, of uh, Quake, the original networked version of Quake, right? Um, so there was a big difference between Quake and Quake World, which is the next version that came out. And, well, there are multiple differences, but the biggest networking difference was is that they switched between these two models. So the latency model is, 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 the, is basically that, you know, the server is entirely canonical. The, the entire, you know, simulation, the entire execution of the game occurs on server side. And, I, as a client, tell the server, oh, I've just moved forward, right? And then the server runs, you know, the next iteration of its, of its simulation and the calculation and then broadcasts it back out to the client. And even I, as the client, if, you know, the one who, you know, had just sent this I moved forward message doesn't actually respond to that until after it gets the response back, right? So what you have there is, is a significant latency between user action and the response and the reaction of the game itself, and you can perceive that, right? Um, depending on the game and, and, and how it's, and, and depending on the actual you know, network latency and whatnot, it's gonna be more or less noticeable. Um, this rewind or its uh, approach is, is, is fundamentally different. You basically will have two or up to N concurrent simulations. So the client actually is running the simulation as well. It's a full-fledged version of the game, um, and it basically um, is doing predictive movement. You know, if, it determine, if it detects that you've told the game that um, you know, you're moving forward, it's going to go ahead and do that, and, and you're good to go. The problem is you know, all of these actions are going on simultaneously, and they all need to be processed. They still need to make the server the canonical version of what's going on. Um, so the server might find out, oh, okay, well, player A was moving forward, but player B was just detecting, and actually, you know, in this in this case, let's let's say a first-person shooter. So player B 
has fired at player A and in fact hits them and, and, and they've been killed. So their character is dead this round. So now the client, you know, for player A, for me, has to be told this has happened. And now I need to drop the, what I've, you know, I had assumed that I'd gotten to walk these three steps forward. But in fact, I only got one step forward and I was hit, I'm done. And so now we're going to need to do, basically rewind what happened, um, process these new events that come from, coming from the server, coming from externally, and then re rerun the simulation up to that point. And there's some really cool, I've got some links in here later, but um, you know, Valve, uh, Valve Software has some cool white papers on how to handle things like this and, and actual interesting um, you know, timing algorithms and how to compare deltas in time. Um, but effectively, you know, the, the better job you have this rewind out, you, know, you do of implementing this sort of rewind logic, uh, the less um, you're going to notice um, its effects, but you're still going to be um, um, susceptible to you know, the snap, it's kind of the term for it, which is basically when the player, instead of, you know, when basically events get rewound and you replay back forth, it's, it's you know, either you're going to manifest in jumping or skips or you're seeing, you know, basic replaying of activities. Um, but again, it's just a fundamental aspect. It's a trade-off of, of a, of a network-based game. Um, so this relates back to before that it's much easier to use, to, to implement client-server uh, physics based off of uh, a delta time algorithm because then you can compare timestamps and you can do this rewinding and things like that. Um, so in, in, in practice, all uh, serious real-world uh, client-server games are going to use that approach. Um, all, all the things related to this, you're going to need to implement some sort of custom protocol for your game. Uh, you're going to need to do things like tracking positions, uh, transmitting actions, simple control protocol like I've joined the server, the game is starting, someone's scored, you know, uh, we've met a win condition, right? All of these uh, communications, you're going to wind up with a, a, a custom protocol of some kind. And there's a couple of approaches uh, you can, can take, uh, basically, and you know, we've, we've seen this before, and also, you know, it's no different than um, you know, XML versus proprietary binary formats or, or what have you. Um, the same sort of trade-offs exist, and historically, um, you know, binary pack data um, is the more uh, common uh, approach of the two. Um, and still, for most performance games, you're going to want to do that. But um, text-based approaches have a nice, have uh, you know some niceties to them. Particularly when you're looking at you know debugging your own game and you're, and, you're, and you're in the process of implementing it, it's great to be able to see a human-readable packet and look. Okay, well, I've seen what the state is. I've seen you know the X, Ys of my various components and, and things like that. So a couple approaches. Um, there's a couple of good tools used to do this. One, I mean, obviously you can just be applying regexes and, and, and matching off of, you know, strings that are coming in. Uh, but that gets sloppy and it gets ugly. Um, Raggle or Ragel or however you pronounce it um, is a nice, um, basically a, a, a text parser. It's a, it's a, it's a parser grammar. Um, that is used in such uh, software that you probably use or have used all the time, such as Mongrel or Thin or uh, um, HPRCOT, uh, used uh, generated Raggle grammars to uh, parse either you know, the HTTP, HTTP protocol in the former cases, or actually parsing XML in the latter. Um, the nice thing about it um, is that it's both very fast, because it, the, the parsers it generates are very fast, and it can target multiple, um, uh, multiple languages. Uh, so an initial goal of, of wrong, and one that you know, it will meet eventually, uh, was to be cross-platform, right? So if um, you know, I had a parser for C, Ruby, um, for MRI, uh, or sorry, if, if, I, if I'm targeting MRI, or I'm targeting JRuby, um, you could actually use uh, Raggle to generate a C-based parser. Uh, this is essentially a native extension for C, or generate a Java-based parser that's effectively a, the, a native extension for JRuby, right? Um, but in the meantime, you could just decide to have it target and output Ruby, 
uh, which is going to run on either side, right? And still be fast, but not necessarily be as fast as if you uh, were targeting the underlying architecture. An entire alternative to that, um, which is very, which is very recent and, and just much, much simpler, is this notion of tight net strings, which um, you know, both of these things, I came out of paying attention, you know, I, I came across both of these things because I was paying attention to what Zed Shaw was saying, which, you know, um, he's obviously a very bright guy, um, if we have different, you know, different opinions on things or whatnot, but um, type net strings are a, a much simpler text-based format um, that are sort of a combination of, of the two. It's, it's sending a compacted string over the wire, but uh, a much... Uh, simpler format, and it's worth checking out as, as, a, as a recently emerging idea for um, doing uh, client server network communications, which obviously is something Zed's been doing a lot of. Um, so there's a list of resources that you're not expected to be able to read here. Um, these slides are, are, will exist and are able to be downloaded, so you can get there. Uh, you can ping me uh, on Twitter if you so choose. Um, so this, this talk was, was uh, meant to be about wrong initially. It was the, it was the idea. And um, did not deliver to the extent that, that I, I wanted to, but uh, will continue to implement it uh, and we'll get out there. But what is the state of it currently? Um, you can play it. You can gem install wrong. And you can play two-player on your machine. Um, so please feel free to do so. Um, and you, know, you can play back and forth and, you know, and give me feedback. Um, the physics as far as you know, intersection and, and doing collision detection and whatnot, that's uh, not, it's, it's not in the final state, um, but it's enough that if you get you know, bored between talks at some point in the next day or so, um, you can play the game. Um, and then feel free to give me plenty of critical feedback because it's but it is very early. Um, yeah, so Jim and Straw wrong. It is, it is there. Uh, the future, in the future, which I guess roughly means like 1978 because Pong's been around for quite some time. Um, one, you know, one thing that, you know, the goal you know, on toward, toward world domination of the Ruby gaming community um, one of those things is, is to, to be able to do, uh, you know, built-in server detection. So um, you want to actually write a, a, a service and have a canonical service out there that will be a listing of uh, any different servers that are running. Uh, if you want to have a local serv server running and, you know, in your office and you can pop up the client and people can, you know, play during coffee break or whatever. Um, do I necessarily, and for the record, do I necessarily think that it's going to take the world by storm and everyone's going to be playing Pong and Ruby? No, but to me it's an interesting intellectual exercise. Um, uh, so in addition to that, um, in addition to sort of server lookup uh, facility, uh, built-in leaderboards, right? So you can have a leaderboard in your office. Uh, you could have a, you know, a, there will be a canonical service with which you can register some name and you can play against each other across, you know, um, you know on, on, on different uh, servers across the world, ideally. Um, but, of course, this, aside from it just simply being Pong, uh, it's, it's Ruby and, you know, Valve, for example, let's say uh, you know, Valve software writes uh, Counter-Strike and Half-Life and very successful and awesome, amazing uh, 3D games. And they spent, and they're very, very brilliant people, and they spent a lot of money doing a lot of work to lock down uh, cheating in their games, right? Well, even if I were that bright, uh, I'm not going to be investing the effort into locking down wrong from, from cheaters. So I was also thinking at some point in the, in the, in the future, have a, uh, you know, a bot division, an you know, officially recognized bot division. So if you really care enough that you want to hack wrong, well, just you know, write your bot and it can play against someone else's bot. You know, I don't know. That, that, that time may come, it may not. Um, but uh, the goal is, is to at least have um, actual, have the ability for people to, um, uh, you know, play against each other across, you know, geographically disparate locations, um, you know, uh, by August. Why August? It may happen sooner. 
Um, but there will be a, a, a lovely Ruby conference in, in Madison uh, coming up in August, and I think I'm going to get to go talk there too. So, uh, so I have I have between now and then to actually get the client or sorry the server half of the client server implementation. Uh, but other than that, uh, that's all I've got. So uh, you know, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, slurs, what's that? Sure. Uh, now, the irony, well, assuming this doesn't blow up, which it very, no, it shouldn't, um, I'm actually really, really bad at Pong. <laughs> so. so it is there. You can theory play. <laughs> Thank you. Oops. <laughs> yeah, so I got, need to fix that one. But. Either way, I win. Thank you. Um, if you want to see the code, it's uh, uh, my, Matt Yo uh, GitHub Matt Yoho wrong. And, uh, Right. Um, that's a great question that I was started to avoid. Um, when, I, when I started the initial version of it, I started uh, TDDing. And actually, I think this is a valid point. So I, I was TDDing. Um, and th there's a goal. The, the project is broken up into a few different sections. There's a client, a server, and this intermediate of things that kind of, can kind of go back and forth, because I was trying to take the approach of simulating on the server and, uh, or sorry, having it be in both. And so that, that middle section where you're doing the physics and whatnot, that's, that's very easy to, to test. Um, and I was test driving it. But I found, I mean, this, I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of stuff was pretty new to me. So a lot of it was spiking. And I kind of wound up dropping tests for the first run. So the, my intention is, is to kind of do a, another pass and to do more TD on, on things that I, that I can. As far as like integration testing on you know, the, 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 the client, I don't have good answers for that one. Um, I might try to find some sort of intermediate format that could easily be tested, you know, like some sort of text-based format to just run iterations, um, which I, I think I did an approach similar to that when I did a, a Conway that I TDD'd, right? So yeah, we'll see. Um, check the repo a month from now and see, see what's going on. Um, I had hoped initially, but um, like three or four other talks came up between then and now. So. Oh, I see. Well, was there any particular part of the implementation that was hardest? I don't think any of it necessarily was, was more or less hard. It was just something, like part of the reason I, I went, wanted to do it was because there were several things I was curious about but had never done. And I think it was just, it was more about spending a lot of upfront time wrapping my head and doing a lot of reading and research before diving in. So that, that took longer than I'd hoped. And I think that's it. So thank you.